So hi everyone, I'm Krista Averill. I'm the assessment coordinator for the main three-year assessment as well as the main science assessment. And today during our session, we're gonna be looking at RIT score comparability, specifically between the main three-year assessment and the math growth assessment. So we're gonna be looking at three different uh, areas today. The first will be comparisons for our double testers, those students who took both the math growth and the three-year assessments. We'll also be looking at comparisons of growth from fall to spring over two academic years. And then we'll be looking at next steps the department will be taking moving forward. So before we jump into our data comparison for our students who are double testers, first I just want to make sure that we have a solid background knowledge regarding standard error of measurement, because this is really the foundation of our comparisons going forward. So all achievement test scores, whether it's NWEA's assessments or assessments from other assessment vendors, are estimates of a student's trait, in particular a latent trait that we can't see, for example, math knowledge or reading ability. And because the trait can't be seen, our test developers make inferences based on the student's answers to a range of questions. So the standard error of measurement, or the SEM, indicates that estimated scores precision. And we know that multiple factors can impact a student's score or estimated ability, such as careless errors by the student, lucky guesses by the student, distractions in the testing environment, or even idiosyncrasies in the assessment content, for example, how a particular item was worded. So for example, when NWEA is calculating SEM, one aspect that they consider is was the student's answering pattern predictable or expected, or was it erratic? Was there something a little bit off about it that should be considered? Looking a little more closely at RIT score standard error of measurement. So this is a screenshot from a sample student profile report that's available as part of the Map Growth Reports portfolio. And here we can see that the student score of 203 in math is actually an estimate. And this SEM or standard error is plus or minus three RIT points. That indicates that the student's true score would likely fall between 200 to 206 RIT points. And so I want to look a little more closely about what we actually mean by likely. And this is going to lead us to talk a little bit about confidence intervals. So we know that 200 to 206 is the range within which there's a 68% chance that that student's true score lies. With 203, that reported score representing the most likely estimate. If we expand that range around that estimated score, then we're increasing our confidence interval. So if we take that standard error of measure and we multiply it by two and get approximately plus or minus six RIT score points, then there's a 95% chance that a student's true score, a true accurate score that reflects their ability lies within 197 to 209 RIT score points. So as you see, as we get into those larger confidence intervals, we're also getting into some pretty substantially large RIT score point ranges. And it's important to make sure that we're looking not only at that reported estimated score, but also considering the standard error of measurement and the range in which that score likely falls. So the typical SEM or the typical standard error of measurement for map growth ranges from 2.8 to 3.5 RIT score points. And we'll be using those numbers as the basis of a lot of our comparisons today. So as we're looking at our score comparisons, first I just want to help you understand the data set that we were working with. So in spring 2023, 9,784 map growth assessments were administered in reading with an average of 1,398 assessments per grade level. Similarly, in spring 2023, we had 10,221 map growth assessments administered in math with an average of 1,460 assessments per grade level. And so we had a substantial portion of main student population taking the map growth assessment in addition to the main through year assessment in spring 23, as these numbers only represent our double testers and not students in those off grades. 
when we're looking at the characteristics of our quote unquote double testers, which are students who took both map growth and the mean through year assessment, we can see from this chart that those demographics are largely the same as the demographics of our single testers, the students who took only the map, the mean through year assessment in spring of 23. So we can see that the double testers represent to a large extent the same population demographics that we expect from the rest of the student population. So one of the key points that we're going to be looking at is the difference between scores. So what we did with most of this analysis is we looked at the difference between a student's main through year assessment score and their map growth score. And we would expect when we have each of those individual student differences and take the mean or the average, that that average or mean difference is less than the typical standard error of measurement for map growth. So less than 2.8 RIT score points. That is, that's the Department of Education's expectation is that would show us that the difference is so close that it's less than what one would typically expect the variation to be for one student and one assessment. And so in this histogram here, you can see the distribution of differences in all scores. And we are definitely gonna break this down by content area and grade level in a moment. But just to give you an idea, when we took all of that data and we took the students main through year assessment score minus their map growth assessment score and plotted it here, that black line shows us where that difference was zero points. So where they were the same. And we can see a pretty equal distribution of students who performed better on the map growth assessment, which would be your scores to the left of that black line, and students who performed better on the through year assessment, which would be the scores to the right of that black line. And so what we see and what we would expect to see if the two assessments were comparable is an even distribution on both sides of that black line. So this is a quick overview for you. We're gonna be looking into each of these grade levels and content areas in more detail, but I just wanna bring your attention to this. So this is a table showing the mean difference between scores for each grade level and content area. And so you can see in the right-hand column of each of the content areas charts, the average RIT difference taking the through year assessment minus the map growth assessment. And if we take the absolute value of those values there, we see that with the exception of the one in red, which we are definitely going to address, they are less than 2.8. So they are less than the typical standard error of measurement for the map growth assessment. And we're gonna be looking at each of these. So let's start with reading. So this is the distribution of differences in scores for reading for all grade levels. So again, that black line is the zero point. That's the point in which there was no difference in scores between map growth and the main through year assessment for students who took both tests in spring of 2023. And so we can see that the scores to the left are for students who performed better on map growth and scores to the right are for students who performed better on the through year assessment. And we are seeing a pretty fair equal distribution between the two. Um, you will notice here that the ranges of this are pretty extreme. Those reflect the actual values of the students who took the test. So we were seeing students who performed up to 50 points better on the through year assessment and students who performed up to 50 points better on the map growth assessment. We did have those outliers on both sides of the spectrum. If we look at grade three, so as we get to smaller student populations, even if we had a perfect normal distribution, which of course we don't, they would, the graph would still look less smooth because the student population is smaller. So again, that black line represents that point in which there would be a zero difference in scores between through year assessment and map growth assessment for students who took both in spring of 23. And then we see that distribution on each side. So the mean difference for students in reading who took reading in grade three was a positive 0 0.07 RIT score points. So less than one tenth of one RIT score point. When we're looking at reading grade four, we're seeing 
a mean difference when we take the through year assessment scores minus the math growth assessment scores for every student and find the average, a mean difference of negative 1.15 grit score points. So definitely within um, what we would want to see, which is less than 2.8 because that's the typical standard error of measurement for math growth. When we're looking at grade five, again, we see a fairly even distribution on both sides. This is a sample size of about 1,200 students. And when we take the mean difference of all of those students, we're looking at a mean difference of negative 1.07 RIT score points. And so for all of these histograms, those bars or bands, they're three RIT score points. So whether we're looking at the entire student population in Maine or if we're looking at reading or math, just be assured that those bars are always the same width in terms of RIT score points. This is for reading in grade six. So again, pretty equal distribution on both sides. Um, we're looking at a mean difference of negative 1.37 RIT score points between students who took the through year assessment and the math growth assessment. Reading grade seven, mean difference of negative 1.82 grid score points. Grade eight, negative 1.11 grid score points. And then high school, our grade of concern. So you can see here that the high school assessment looks drastically different in the histogram than any of our assessments have thus far. We can see that that black line where it would be a zero RIT score difference between through year and math growth is pushed to the right. And the bulk of our scores happen to be to the left of that. The bulk of our scores do show that students performed in reading in high school worse on the through year assessment. So we're gonna talk in a moment about how we're going to address this moving forward and how we're essentially going to fix this problem. Before we get there, I just want to share with you one of the um, pieces of information that's been shared by NWEA thus far, and that's a RIT score difference comparison for reading between students who take math growth and math growth and students who take through year assessment and math, gro math growth. So that pink bell curve that's hidden behind the blue one, that one is the difference in scores for students who take math growth twice within the same test administration period. And that's not just main students, that's national data. So that's based over multiple years based on the 6.7 students who take, 6.7 million students rather, who take math growth every year. And then that blue bell curve would be the differences for students who took means through year assessment and the math growth assessment. And so again, we're seeing that slight shift to the left. Um, that is reflective in part of those extreme values that we were seeing for high school, which certainly need to be addressed. So what are our next steps to improve our comparability for reading writ? So for all grades, we're adding standalone items that are not linked to lengthy reading passages to the fall, winter, and spring assessments. So as a note, all of the items in NWEA's three-year summative item bank are linked to reading passages. There are no standalone items. And so when we're looking to pull standalone items into our spring assessment, we have to pull them from the map growth item bank for the diagnostic portion of the assessment, which comprises about one third of each grade level's assessment. And then for high school in particular, we're acknowledging that this was an operational field test. So all of the summative questions, that's two thirds of the spring assessment were new and never previously administered to students. This is because NWEA's other through year assessment state partners do not use NWEA for their high school assessments. So all of these items have been specifically developed by NWEA for means assessment. And given our tight timeline for submission of evidence to USDOE for peer review, which is this winter, a true field test was not possible. One of the things we're doing is we're requesting that NWEA re-examine the RIT score alignment of their high school reading summative questions. So of the questions that contribute both to a student's RIT score and to their main specific skilled score. And we're asking that because there's a discrepancy, even though NWEA is not yet ready to release the reports that contain those main specific skilled scores, it's going to take them 
understandably some time to get all of that information in those reports and quality check it, we know that there's a discrepancy between students' performance according to their RIT and their main specific scaled scores for high school reading because we know that the results from the summative portion of the assessment indicate that on average, students in high school performed equally well in reading as students in other grades. And so we really need to re-examine that RIT score alignment of those high school reading summative items so that they better reflect that, that there really isn't in terms of performance that big of a difference. So let's look at math for a moment. This is just a reminder for you of the mean difference in scores. So quite a few of you have just joined as we've been in the middle of this. So just as a quick overview, what we did for each student who double tested, students who took both the through year assessment and the math growth assessment in spring of 23, was we took that student's main through year assessment score minus their math growth score. And then we found the average of all of those values for each of these populations by grade and content area. And so the expectation would be that the absolute value of these values here in that right-hand column would be less than the typical standard error of measurement expected for math growth, which the lower range of that is 2.8. So this is the distribution of differences in scores for math for all grades. Every student that took both the math, math, growth, math growth assessment and the math through year assessment, we found those differences and they're plotted here in this histogram. And that black line again represents that zero point where there was zero difference in the RIT score points between the math growth assessment and the through year assessment for those double testers. And so you can see here at the bottom of the screen that mean difference when we take all of that data and find the average was a negative 0.45 RIT score points. If we're looking at math for grade three, we do see a slight, very minimal shift in students performing better, quote unquote, on the through year assessment. So that mean difference is a plus 1.60 RIT score points. So that's still within our standard error of measurement. I wouldn't necessarily say students are performing better because it still falls within the variation we would expect for that single student. For math grade four, we're seeing a mean difference of 0 0.07 RIT score points. So again, less than one tenth of one RIT score point. For math, mean difference of negative 0 0.10 grit score points, fairly equal distribution on both sides. For grade six, negative 1.03 grit score points. Again, fairly equal distribution on both sides. For grade seven, a mean difference of negative 1.63 grit score points. For grade eight, mean difference of negative 0 0.37 RIT score points. And then although high school is not unusual because that absolute value still falls less than 2.8, it is one for us to look at and that mean difference is negative 2.45. So even though this is not statistically significant, it is still something that the department wants to look at in more depth since it is different from the other values for math. Again, this is just one of the pieces of information provided by NWEA um, regarding RIT score differences. So that pink bell-shaped curve in the back is the difference between math growth scores for students who took math growth more than one time in the same administration window. And again, that's national data, that's not main specific data. And then that blue bell curve that's in front of it is the difference between scores for students who took both map growth and the through year assessment within the same spring 23 administration window. And then we can see a fairly good overlap between the two. So our next steps to improve comparability for our math RIT scores really lie with high school since they were the relative outliers compared to the other RIT score differences. So again, recognizing this is an operational field test and there's definitely room for improvement. 
since these items were never previously administered to students. So one of the things we're working with NWEA to do is to really examine the most difficult clusters of summative items. So when we're looking at our summative assessment blueprints, the standards are grouped into clusters and a certain percentage of the questions on the assessment have to be from those clusters. And we're looking at the ones that students performed the most poorly on. So the ones that the lowest percentage of students answered the items correctly. We're really going to dig into that and see what is it about those questions? Is it an opportunity to learn issue? Is it something that students typically would have seen in algebra two in their junior year, but now they're being assessed in their second year of high school? Is it about the complexity of the item itself? We have standards that are taught in both Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, but they're taught to a greater level of complexity in Algebra 2. And so is it reflective of that in some way? And so that's some of the work and analyses we've started with NWEA to really look at that high school um, alignment between writ and summative items. So moving on to our second topic, taking a turn and thinking about all students across the state of Maine in grades three through eight. So not just our double testers, but everyone. We're gonna talk about trends in fall to spring RIT score growth. So in July, 2023, NWEA published a research brief on the 22-23 achievement data. Now the focus of this research brief was primarily and largely that achievement gains during 22-23 fell short of pre-pandemic trends. And just one of the things I want you to consider when you're looking at your achievement percentiles or your growth percentiles for RIT scores is that the 2020 NWEA national norms that those percentiles are based on are actually based on data from 2015 to 2018. So just keep that in mind whenever you're looking at those numbers that you're actually comparing that student to how students performed before the pandemic. And so NWEA does release new norms every four to five years. So we can expect that next year or the year after um, that those tables would be updated. And so essentially what the report goes through is just looking at gains during 22-23 relative to pre-COVID trends. If you choose to read the report, this is a visual from the report that shows that with the exception of grade three, students were showing less achievement gains or less growth in 22-23. But that's not really necessarily the focus of the report that matters to us the most at this time. Also in this report, NW, NWEA indicated that the trend in 22-23 achievement gains or the growth in 22-23 was lower than what they had observed nationally in 2021-22. So that was a national trend for all of the students who took MAP growth. So that's about 6.7 million students who take MAP growth every year. And so the question is, what are we seeing in Maine? We know a national trend, but what are we seeing here in our state? And so before I get into our calculations, I do wanna clarify what data the State Department of Education has and doesn't have. So just for clarification, I don't have access to, and the Maine DOE doesn't have access to MAP growth reports. So we can't necessarily use data like projected RIT or percentage of students who met or exceeded their projected rate, or percent of projected growth met. That data is not available to us. But what we do have is we have the NWEA's 2020 achievement and growth norms that they have posted publicly. And we also have the fall and spring RIT scores for Maine students from 21-22, and then also last academic year, 22-23 for grades three through eight. And so using those data points, the 2020 national norms, which are on the screen right now, as well as individual student data, we can calculate something called a growth index. So what we take is that student's actual growth from fall to spring, so their fall, their spring score minus their fall score for RIT scores, and we divide it by the expected growth or the mean growth that one would see based on these tables. And you'll notice here, that the mean fall to spring growth is different for each content area and different for each grade level. And so when we're doing our calculations regarding growth, we need to take that into consideration. 
growth for a third grade student in reading is very different than expected growth for an eighth grade student in reading. Generally, with vertically scaled assessments like math growth and vertical skills like RIT scales, we expect to see more growth at the younger grade levels. And so when we're looking at how we're calculating this number for individual students based on the data that we have, we take their actual growth, that spring minus fall score, and divide it by the expected growth provided by the norms tables to give us a growth index. So if a student's actual growth is 11 RIT score points for a third grader in reading, and the expected growth is 10.5 points, if we do 11 divided by 10.5, we get 1.05. And so what you may see from that is if a student's actual growth equals their expected growth, we would expect that growth index to be about 1.00 or they've met 100% of their growth. Now let's say a student has no RIT score increase, their fall score equals their spring score. In that case, Actual growth is zero, expected growth it remains 10.5 because we're still talking about grade three reading and zero divided by 10.5 is zero. That student made 0% of their expected growth. If their actual growth is 21 RIT score points and the expectation was 10.5, we do that division, actual divided by expected, 21 divided by 10.5, and we get 2.00 or the student made 200% of their expected growth. It was twice the amount that one would expect. And we can also have negative values the way that we're calculating this. So let's say a student's score in the spring was lower than their score in the fall, because it happens. So if the score in the spring was negative, or it was five points lower than it was in the fall, we would do negative five divided by 10.5 for a growth index of negative 0.48. So you may have noticed that I've been calling these unrestricted growth indices at the top of each slide. So what unrestricted means is that we're not placing any limits on values for individual students. So we're allowing negative values if students had a lower spring score than they did in the fall. We're including outliers, even though we know that in some cases, students are showing huge differences in their RIT score values from fall to spring, just like we saw that students were showing huge differences in values within one administration. We also are looking at a large population size, all of the students in grades three through eight who took the state's reading and math assessments. And so this unrestricted measure where we take the outliers and the students who made negative growth, whose spring score was lower than their fall, it's acceptable for this analysis because we're using such a large population. If we were to try to extend this, however, to the SAU or the school level, applying some restrictions would be appropriate because we'd want to reduce that impact of the extreme outliers on the average. Okay, so these are the averages. For every student, we calculated their spring minus fall to get their actual growth, and then we divided that value by the expected growth according to the norms tables. And so in the middle column for reading, you'll say AY22. So that's academic year 22, which is fall 21 to spring 22. And so just focusing on grade three reading, it's a 0 0.83. If student growth in Maine for reading in grade three, had met pre-pandemic norms, we would expect that value to be a 1.0 because you'll have students who would have met the mean and then you would have had an equal distribution of students who exceeded that as did not meet it. And so looking in fall 21 to spring 22, we are seeing lower numbers than one would expect based on national norms for pre-pandemic growth. What we're also seeing is when we look to that next column for last academic year, we are seeing with the exception of grade three math that those numbers do decrease from 21-22 to last academic year 22-23. And then in math, we're seeing that same pattern. Now the differences in that decrease vary grade by grade. But in general, we're following that same pattern that NWEA indicated in their research brief. So we know that in 22-23, Maine students as a whole 
demonstrated less growth than in 21-22. We know also that in 22-23, national data from 6.7 million students also showed less growth than in 21-22. What we don't know and what we've asked NWEA to provide is to what degree did the decreases in growth in Maine align to those that we're seeing nationwide? There was very minimal information about that decrease in the research brief because it wasn't the focus of the research brief. And so we've requested more information to have a fuller understanding of what we're seeing with our RIT score data. So now next steps moving forward, where is the department going from here? So our next step is to review the comparability evidence provided by our vendor. This was originally expected to be delivered in July of this summer. We're now expecting to receive it tomorrow on September 1st. So I can assure you as soon as we have it, we will be digging into it and looking deeply at all of that data. We did see some preliminary comparability evidence um, and notice that they didn't include high school. So we've requested that when NWEA presents us with their report that they include high school analyses in that report. We're also recognizing that assessment development is an iterative process and there's gonna be continuous potential for improvements. So moving forward, we're always looking at how we can improve the assessment. We're never just taking it as it is and saying it's good enough. We're also compiling the comparability evidence into one report. So we're going to take both the analyses we've done as well as what NWEA provides to us in the future. We're gonna craft some sample communications for schools and SAUs to use with stakeholders, for example, school boards and families. And those communications are going to be slightly different for those two audiences because the needs of those audiences are different. And then on September 18th at our next comparability session, we're going to include all of the new information from NWEA. So we won't be repeating this information. We're gonna focus on the new information that we have from them by that time. And we are going to transition to the Q&A portion.